You've been praying diligently, but something seems off. Could something be blocking your prayers? Imagine sending a text, but it never gets delivered. Could our prayers be facing similar issues? There's a deeper connection awaiting you in your prayer life. Let's discover answers to those questions as we delve into this subject of prayer today. But first, let's ask God to give us wisdom. Father in heaven, thank you that you're here with us. Thank you that you want to draw us to yourself and grant us a rich, meaningful spiritual experience with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer is one of the weapons that God has given us in the conflict between good and evil. I've seen this up close. I remember an occasion in India where we were going to baptize about 500 people. We knew that we could not baptize them in the city of Chennai. It would draw too much attention and Hindu militants would become fiercely angry and react. So we rented buses and took these 500 people out of the city about two hours to a small Adventist camp and baptized there. The next morning after the baptism, it was a Sunday morning, the conference president called me and he said, Pastor Mark, we've got a problem. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, one of the buses got lost. And uh, as it got lost, there were 22 people on it and they never were baptized and they want to be baptized this morning. Can you come to the baptism? I said, I'd be happy to come, but you know, our plane is flying out in the afternoon and I can never make it two hours out to the baptismal site and two hours back. He said, no, there's no problem. There's a small, there's a river and it's not too far from the city. We can go to that river and baptize. Take us about a half an hour to get there. So I agreed. When we got to the river site, I was nervous. We had to parade these 22 people through an open field not far from a village. When we got to the river, there were a number of women, Hindu women, washing their clothes. There are other Hindu men sitting up on a, on a bank. And I was nervous about it and because I knew that these people being baptized into the Christian faith would be offensive to them. Now, the Hindus believe in more than 140,000 different gods. And uh, one of the gods is the river god. And I was very anxious. Have you ever gone into an experience where you just felt something is not right? You're quite anxious about it. Well, the first few baptisms went well. I was on the shore. I'd raise my hand. I'd say, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the first few baptisms went really, really well. But then the third round of baptisms, there were three pastors in the water baptizing. And they were going to baptize three candidates at a time, but the center pastor was going to baptize a young woman. It was like unseen hands came out of the heavens and pushed her under the water. She looked like she was drowning, actually. And she came up out of the water, spitting out water and coughing and gasping. And then she went down again, spitting and gasping. And I thought, if this woman drowns in that water and dies, the word is going to go out to this whole village and community that the snake god, the river god, rather, uh, killed her. And that if anybody becomes a Christian, that's going to be their fate. And I just prayed, Lord, do something. The other two pastors that were on the side of the central pastor ran over to help him. They pulled the lady up out of the water. She was spitting out water and she broke free from them. Her eyes were rolling in her head. She was hissing at the mouth. A deep voice was coming out of her saying, you cannot have me, you cannot have me. She ran with cat-like claws, jumped at my throat. I was standing on the shore. I stepped back, it was muddy on the shore. She slipped and fell down, writhing, kicking. The conference president's wife was next to me and I took, I said, do you have a Bible? She said, yes. She gave me a Bible and I knelt down in the mud, put the Bible on the lady's head and she was kicking and flailing. He began to pray and pray and pray and pray. And as I prayed, pretty soon this lady fell limp, just totally limp. We lifted her up. She said, pastor, can I be baptized? There was a new smile on her face, a new sparkle in her eyes. We brought her into the water baptized her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Later on in the bus, I learned that she had been involved in spiritualism and demonic worship as a child. Now, there are three levels of demonic activity. First, there's temptation. Every one of us are tempted by the devil. Secondly, there's oppression. If you yield to temptation, you become oppressed by the devil if you keep yielding. But possession 
cannot take place unless you voluntarily choose. Because unless a person voluntarily chose, the devil would possess everybody. So don't get afraid to think, oh, this person's possessed, that person's possessed. The devil just can whisk down on them. No, not at all. Um, they may be tempted, they may be oppressed by the devil, but not possessed unless they make a choice. Intercessory prayer is incredibly powerful. As I prayed over this woman that day in the mud on the riverside in India, I saw once again the power of prayer. Jesus Christ believed in the power of prayer. Before his ministry and choosing the disciples, he prayed. Before going to Jerusalem for crucifixion, he prayed. Before most activities in ministry, every morning he prayed. When you look at Mark chapter 1, we find in Mark chapter 1 the prayer life of Jesus outlined clearly. And in this presentation on prayer, I want to be very, very practical with you. I want to share with you five major points that you can immediately incorporate into your prayer life that will make a significant difference. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. There are three things about the text. First, it was in the morning before daylight. Now, that does not mean that every one of us get up at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. What it does mean is Jesus had a time to pray, a regular time, just as most people have regular times to eat. They may eat in the morning, midday, and some eat in the evenings, a lighter meal, we hope. But um, just as we have regular times to eat, just as there are regular times to go to work, if your prayer life is spasmodic, praying one day maybe at 7.30, and oh, another day maybe at noon, and maybe missing two or three days, you are not going to have a very meaningful relationship with God. So the first point is establish a regular time to pray. Could be every single morning, but if you, uh, and most, for most of us, that's the best time. But maybe you're a housewife who uh, has a couple young kids that are crying, keeping you up at night. You've got to get up and feed maybe a baby. Maybe your best time is not immediately when you get up because maybe you've got to get those kids off to school. But once they, get, once they get off to school and the baby is sleeping and you don't have to feed her or him, maybe you have 9.30 in the morning. That's your prayer time. There were times when I was the speaker of It Is Written Television that I would be up very late at night in my evangelistic meetings. And so I may not get to bed till 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And so for me to get up very early in the morning when I'm going from, from 7, 30, 8 o'clock till 11 o'clock at night at times would have been very difficult. Every, now, don't misunderstand me. Every morning I prayed. Every morning I studied the Bible. But I would often go into my office for my most meaningful prayer time and say to my secretary from 10 to 11 this morning, don't let anybody disturb me. I want to study the Bible and pray. So the, the point is this, not when you have time, what your time is, but that every day you have a regular time to seek God in prayer, that you make that as a specific appointment before God. Now notice here, the Bible says in verse 35, three things right here about Jesus' prayer life. I'm going to share with you five practical things. Three of them are in this text. Now in the morning, having risen a great while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place in their prey. Jesus had a time to pray. Jesus had a place to pray. He had a solitary place that he prayed. We have 17 miles of trails in the community we live in. Very often I go walk those trails and pray. I have a study where uh, I often go to pray. A living room where I have a special chair that I sit and pray often in that chair. Uh, maybe that comes from my father. You know, my, my dad became a Seventh-day Adventist when he was 33 years old and uh, became a real committed Christian. I wasn't yet a Christian at the time, a committed Christian, brought up in a lovely Roman Catholic, by a Roman Catholic mother, went to Catholic schools. Uh, but now I'm 16, I was 16, 17, and uh, I can remember, you know, as an athlete playing golf, playing basketball, uh, TV had just come in, and I would come home at night and 10, 30, 11 o'clock, 16, watch 
programs the late, late, late show, see more snowy pictures on the screen, you know, than, than picture at times. But there was a little crack in the door where our TV was, and I'd look into this other room. It was kind of a sitting reading room, more like a living room. And we had an old black and white vinyl chair with the stuffing coming out. We weren't a very wealthy family at all. Um, and uh, so I'd, I'd noticed Dad kneeling by that chair, and he'd be praying, Oh, Lord, bless my boy. Oh, Lord, Mark is a good boy, but um, he doesn't know you. Bless my boy. His prayers touched my heart. He had a place to pray. He would pray at that old black and white chair. That became his prayer chair, chair of prayer. Do you have a time to pray? Do you have a place to pray? And then the Bible says, in Jesus prayed. Now, Jesus' prayers were not necessarily silent prayers. You remember in Luke chapter 11, now don't misunderstand me. You can pray silently anytime, any place you want. I often pray silently. But there's something special about praying out loud. In Luke 11, verse 1, it says, It came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he had ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. How did they know he ceased? Because Christ was praying aloud. And they had never heard anybody pray like that, and they wanted to be taught how to pray. In Matthew chapter 26, you remember Jesus goes to Gethsemane. He had a prayer time. He'd often go in the morning, sometimes at night, to Gethsemane. He had a prayer place, kneeling under the olive trees in the quietness to pray. And he had a, how did he pray? Look, uh, Matthew 26, verse 39, Gethsemane experience. Jesus went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, now notice he prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not your will, but mine. You let your eyes drop down. Verse 42, he went again a second time and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. You come down now to verse 44. So he left and went out way again and prayed the third time, saying, in other words, Jesus' prayers in Gethsemane were vocal prayers. Probably one of the clearest texts in the Bible on this is Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, and we're looking there um, at, at Hebrews 5, and it talks about Jesus pray, the methods of Jesus' prayer. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard. So Jesus offered up his prayers with vehement cries and tears. He's praying aloud. Somebody says, oh, pastor, I don't want to pray aloud because the devil can't read my thoughts, but he's going to know what I'm praying for and he's going to intercede for me. He's going to intercede and try to block my prayers. The devil is not there when you pray. I love that statement in the first line of the testimonies where Ellen White says that at the sound of earnest prayer, Satan's whole host trembles and flees. So when you're praying, the devil's not going to be there. God shelters you with good holy angels. Now listen to this statement. It's a wonderful statement from a book called Our High Calling. It says, learn to pray aloud. Our high calling, page 130. Learn to pray aloud where only God can hear you. What? Learn to pray how? Aloud where only God can hear you. Now, can we pray silently in our mind? Yes, certainly. And many times it's more appropriate to do that. But if you want the most meaningful relationship with God, have a time to pray. Have a place to pray. Learn to pray aloud before God and part your heart. You see, when you pray silently, Sometimes your mind wanders. Has your mind ever wandered in prayer? Has your mind ever not wandered when you're praying? But when you're praying out loud and, you, and your mouth has to formulate the words, it activates the brain. So when you're praying aloud and your mind wanders, you stop praying out loud, you catch it much more quickly, and you can bring your mind back. Now, there are a couple other things that we want to look at to have a meaningful prayer life. How do you have a meaningful prayer life? First, you pray, you have a time to pray. Regular time. Second, 
you have a place to pray, a regular place. Doesn't mean you don't pray at any other time or any other place. What it means is those are your treasured places to meet God. Thirdly, you pray out loud. Fourth, and this could be one of the most meaningful things, you use the Bible as subject matter for prayer. Prayer is our talking to God. When we use the Bible as subject matter for prayer, it's God talking to us. One of the most meaningful times I've ever had in my prayer life is praying through the Psalms. Now, I don't do this all the time, but if you're struggling with your mind wandering or prayer and not having the relationship with God, you do. Simply bow your head, take your Bible, and say, God, speak to me through your word. I'm going to pray your word back to you. So I begin to read. I might read aloud. Blessed is the man. I'm reading Psalm 1, teaching you how to pray through the Bible. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the, st in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Lord, teach me never to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Lord, as I interface with people today, there are going to be some ungodly people. They may give me some counsel. Lord, help me to find joy and delight in fellowshipping with the saints and the people of God. And when I'm fellowshipping with the ungodly, Lord, help me to be a positive witness. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Lord, help me to make my delight in your law, your way. And it says, and in his law he meditates day and night. Lord, I want not my mind to be filled with the junk that's in Hollywood or a lot of the stuff that's coming over the internet. Lord, teach me to meditate upon your word. And you've said, my life would be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water that spring forth its fruit in season, that his leaves shall not wither. Whatever he does is going to prosper. Well, that's what I want in life. I want my life. So use the Bible as subject matter for your prayers. For example, you can read Psalm 37. And uh, as you're praying, you can certainly use the Bible. See, prayer is not simply to get what we want from God. Prayer is a channel by which we get to know God. Psalm 37, trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 3, who, that's what I want. I want to trust in you. I want to do good, Lord. Dwell in the land, feed on his faith. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Lord, I don't want the desires of my heart. I want the desires of your heart. So I want to delight myself in, in you, Lord, so that your desires become my desires. So here's the fourth thing to do. If you want a meaningful relationship with God, Use the Bible as subject matter for prayer. You can do that in Psalms. You can do it in the epistles of Paul, Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. You can do it in the Gospels wonderfully, reading about the life and death of Christ. And, uh, you know, there are six chapters in the Bible on the death of Christ. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Matthew 26 and 7 together, Mark chapters 14 and 15, Luke chapter 23, and John chapter 19. You can take those six chapters and spend months on them or weeks on them. Read a little bit. Pray over those chapters. Let God impress your mind with the significance of the cross at Calvary. Now, there's one other thing that will help your prayer life, and then we'll summarize. That is what we call the Acts model. Now, in the Acts model... The word acts, A-C-T-S, acts, A is adoration, C is confession, T is thanksgiving, and S is supplication. So in the acts model, what we do is we take a piece of paper and we write A. I want to think of all the things I'm going to adore Jesus about today. I'm going to adore you, Lord, because you're the almighty creator. I'm going to adore you because you're my savior. I'm going to adore you because you're my coming king. Write that down. Confession. Now, nobody will see this paper except you. You can rip it up after you get through with it. Confession. Is there something in my life I want to confess? Oh, yeah, I was impatient here. Oh, yes, I told a half-truth here. I want to confess those today. T, thanksgiving. Lord, this is what I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for my wife, my children. I'm thankful for my home. I'm thankful for this precious message. I'm thankful for Jesus Christ. T is thankful. Supplication. What I want to pray for today. And we write the things down that we supplicate God for, we pray for. And we take that paper that is written upon, and we've written down our, our prayer requests on it. We've written down Acts, Adoration, C, Confession, T, Thanksgiving, S, Supplication. 
and we kneel before God holding that paper, at times opening our eyes to see what's on the paper, and we pray for that. Here are five things that will revolutionize your prayer life. You ready to put them into practice? One, have a time to pray. Two, have a place to pray. Three, pray aloud where only God can hear you. Four, come to Jesus with his word and pray his word to him. And five, use the Acts model. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. If you follow these practical principles, you will have a meaningful prayer life that'll change your life forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you beckon us to pray. You've said, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you shall find. We want to seek you. You said, you shall seek me and find me. Jeremiah 29, 13, verse 13. You'll seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. We want to come to Jesus with all of our hearts. We praise you and thank you that not only do we long to come to you, but you long to come to us, that you're ready to hear and answer our prayers. And we praise you for that in Christ's name. Amen.